Hi, I'm Sha Xin Wei, and I'm the director of the School of Arts, Media, and Engineering and the Synthesis Center. So tonight, I'm going to take you on a journey from the epoch of the personal computer to social media and to where we at Synthesis like to think of as ecosystemic technologies, or also how to design these kind of technologies ecosystemically. Why? Because today, we're swarming with technology. We have, we're swarming with microprocessors. There are microprocessors everywhere, everywhere in the home, everywhere in well, toys, cars, shoes, and clothing soon. And for some of us, microprocessors in our bodies. So the question we ask is, what are we going to do with all this power? Is it just going to be databases and neural nets forever? Or could it be something else? So let's start this journey in 1984 with one of the most famous ads ever broadcast in the Super Bowl. <laughs> January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. Some of you remember that ad. So I was one of the lucky people to be hired to be one of the first programmers for this little machine that didn't have any software for a scrappy little company that nobody heard of, or not very many people heard of. And because there was no software, everything was new. Everything was a first. So we wrote the first interactive video disc for American Sign Language. We did little virtual micro worlds where you could actually uh, pitch planets like uh, marbles around the sun. Uh, we built little ecosystems so little object-oriented wolves could chase little object-oriented sheep running and eating lattices of grass. We wrote also these uh, virtual theater uh, games with work at stage uh, French theater, the scripts and had little virtual actors, can dress them in virtual costumes, and set them on virtual stages. It was all great fun. And by 1996, we were prototyping and uh, envisioning uh, public spaces that could be augmented with media, what we call today mixed reality and augmented reality. This is at Stanford. And we were talking about learning piazzas, where people could walk around, physical space, and the media would follow us. People would follow us, the media would follow us, the, depending on how we were gesturing or collecting or but depending on what we were saying. And then the web happened, World Wide Web, or World Wide Wait. And everything became reduced to a very simple idea of what the computer could do, that is, a document. It was a printed page with pictures and text on it. So I decided to start a little atelier called the Topological Media Lab, where we would build our alternatives. So the World Wide Web happened, and then social media, 2004, Facebook. Now, this kind of model of, of uh, social technologies was a bit different than what we were thinking about in terms of social technologies. Is the social media so social? Or could it be doing this? This is the image of Guy Debord's Society of Spectacle. Was the social media that people are calling social, in fact, giving us these very powerful optics to see the world? But maybe it was also making us, making it very hard for us to see the world through somebody else's optics. In fact, could it be actually making it very hard for us to actually see each other? Or maybe better, to actually engage with each other in all sorts of ways. Here at Synthesis, we have a different way of thinking about the social, implementized by Matisse's beautiful painting, La Danse. So instead of thinking of technology as something we put in between people, or thinking of technology as something we use to wrap or encase ourselves, how about if we think about what people are already doing in everyday space, together, same place, same time, and think about how we can augment everyday activities, working with augmentations of everyday objects, like a table, glass, plates, knives and forks, and lamps so that ordinary gestures or ordinary things could maybe assume or acquire great symbolic charge, extraordinary significance. So this notion of augmentation led us to think about responsive technologies rather than interactive technologies. So interactive technology would be something where, you know, I do something, the computer does something, it says A, B, A, B, A, B, right, turn taking. But in fact, everything in the world is happening concurrently. I'm speaking, you're breathing, People can be cutting, uh, cutting a sandwich or something. Everything's happening at the same time. Another property is this idea of improvisation, that maybe we don't have to tell people what to do, just 
do something ad hoc, improvise. In the system, we do something interesting, no matter what we do. Also, the behavior of our systems can change. Just like there's a first course, second course, third course, maybe the nature of the behavior of these systems could evolve over time, too. So let's look now at this collection that we built of the iTech and WeTech, right? Social technologies. Could it be that you know there's something missing, all right, with these kind of technologies? Well, think about this. What's here in this painting that's not represented? Music, the sound, the humidity, the the sense of the moist, hot tropical air on your skin. Now. An artist doesn't have to represent everything to suggest something. This is a lesson for us. As synthesis, we know that rich experience is much richer than anything we can actually represent explicitly. That rich experience is much richer, lived experience is much richer than anything we can describe with a bunch of tags and keywords or data. So instead, we can think about, well, what is it that makes experience this way or that way? Part of it is relation, the relation between one another, the relation between me and the world. So that means that the whole is more than just the sum of its parts. Now, again, I tech and we tech. Could it be that all this technology is just about empowering us, me, myself, and I, or empowering us humans? So what about the rest of the world? Is it something else? Or is it just remaking, technology is remaking the world in the image of Homo sapiens rex, man the king. What about that gray area? The gray area, the counter space around Da Vinci's Vitruvian man. What else is there in this world? Should we account for that? What's the others in this world? So let me draw two pictures for you, okay, with good old fashioned analog media. Here's the first picture of in response to that question. Here's the social network. Here's me in the middle, right? And what about the other social beings in this network? Here are three more dots. So when to ask in this terms of social network, who are the others in the world? Well, they're the other dots, OK? Just me and other dots. Well, let's draw a different picture, have a different way of doing this. Here we go. I'm a fast drawer. Ta-da. Look, here's me again, one dot. Now I'm going to ask. What are the others in this world? What else is there? I rehearsed this. OK, let's see. I deleted myself from the world to see what else there is. It's everything. Everything, right? It's gravity. It's, uh, it's gravity. It's a, it's a feeling of air, it's capital flows, it's myths and stories, right? It's everything. So can we make responsive media and the responsive infrastructures the way that we make these lamps and tables responsive? Can we do that? And that's what we've done. 15 years of work with the Topological Media Lab and now Synthesis Center, we have a kit of techniques and technologies so that designers can come in and make these kinds of environments themselves more responsive. Now. With the National Centers for Atmospheric Research, we've been able to work with these kinds of responsive environments that the atmosphere scientists use. They make these very complex models. It takes a long time to grind through a simulation that model the Earth's atmosphere and the weather in all its complexities. The way that the wind moves, the pressure, the temperature, the water content, whether it's snow or ice or, uh, or rain or humidity. What we've done is to do the hard work of making it all real time so that as you move, the atmosphere itself is moving with you at real time. So we're scaling you to the scale of a continent or, what, or the eastern seaboard. The model for us for making these kinds of work is the swimming pool. So for us, think about it. With a swimming pool, I can put my finger in it and dip, make circles. I can make to dip in one finger, two fingers, ten fingers, it just makes its ripples. I can make my signature, sign my name, and it does its thing at the speed of physics. Or it could be one person can dump, jump in a swimming pool, two or three, or as many people as will fit into the swimming pool can go in. And these systems will just do their thing richly. 
it's very important that these are responsive and also they're immersive. After all, the atmosphere is bigger than us. So why don't we put ourselves inside the simulation of an atmosphere rather than taking a, the whole atmosphere and putting it into a two-inch square of glass on your phone? Also, we live in one world. So why don't we do this collectively? Bring people together into one space and then play in this one world. I've shown you some examples. We've shown you some examples on stage of responsive ordinary objects enchanted in some way of a bit of a responsive environment, the atmosphere. But I can't show you everything. What we're going to do now is show you some pictures of what we built in the black box back in Matthew Center, at the Synthesis Center. Here you see that people can bring, we can bring the sky to Earth, bring the sky beneath your feet. So as you walk across, you are not just looking at a cloud, looking at a hurricane, you can become a cloud, you can become a hurricane. Instead of looking at wind, which you can't see anyway, through some abstractions like a vector field, you can become wind. So the force of your movement then is interpreted as a force in the atmosphere itself. This is a rigorous form of as if, of play, that I think underlies both science and art. What have we done with this? Well, for, applica for applications, there are many. One is to bring people together who are interested in complex systems, you know, traffic, uh, transportation planners, economists, people working in ecosystems, people who may have incommensurate value frameworks. Farmers, people working on these kinds of infrastructures may have very different interests. But bring people together using both poetic and scientific representations to steer these complex systems in real time so that people can learn to navigate together and to decide what should we do. Another example. Another faculty affiliated with the Synthesis Center has brought the stars to Earth. He comes to us with a background in experimental theater and experimental technologies. In this kind of system, as you walk through the star field, these motorized lights, the way you move, your gesture, the way you walk can shape the constellation. In fact, the tone of your voice, the timbre of your voice can color the constellation more. The media systems that you've seen earlier that animate this table, or the media systems that you've seen animate the, the atmosphere, we can also use to color or shape the stars. something very important about this to note. There's no AI. There's no need to train the system using neural nets or some other model, because every motion of the head, every tilt, every, every gesture of nuance of the, of, the, of, the, of the hands or feet is mapped in some way to the configuration of stars. That means a person can come in without having been trained in the system, and the system doesn't have to be trained ahead of time either, because it's very rich in its behavior. Without this need for pre-training, pre people can make up gestures that are meaningful on the fly, by themselves or together. People can make up the context. People can make up the scenarios. You can make up your stories. We don't give you a story prefab. You make it up. Another thing I like to do is to show you a moment of what it's like to make this kind of thing. This is a moment from the months of work it took to make Cosmos come to life. This is the first time that my daughter, Corinne, encountered this Cosmos system. Let's see what happens when things go a little haywire. We never get to show things running haywire. So, look. Chris Ziegler. Credit to Chris Ziegler and his team. Um, when I try to assess how well the environments are working, it's kind of rich environments, often I look to when people are laughing or smiling. They can tell us a lot more than a questionnaire or even sometimes sensor data. Well, how? When 
a person is smiling in such a system, it could indicate that she's getting it, she understands it, even if she cannot articulate her understanding in words. And when somebody's laughing, when you laugh, it could be this delighted discovery. And we're trying to make environments where we discover, we create. Over the years, Synthesis and its predecessor, the Topological Media Lab, have hosted, been home to hundreds of courageous, adventurous people from all disciplines. Uh, musicians, artists, dancers, also engineers, philosophers, anthropologists, and hackers. So we've come together to try to invent new techniques for making environments in which people can be collectively creative. We're making environments that are responsive, open-ended, rather than pre-formatted. We're making environments that enable people to imagine the world other, other than the way it is, and then not just to imagine it, but to prototype it, to make palpable environments that we can all try out. Now, synthesis doesn't mean we have a one-size-fits-all technique. What it does mean is that people come to us and we, we, we have inquiries that are rich and they demand synthesis. These inquiries are very substantial, they require these different disciplines to come together, maybe different disciplines for different inquiries. So I hope you'll come and visit us. I hope some of you might even join us and help explore these different techniques of making and prototyping worlds. I'd like to invite members of the Synthesis Center to come on stage, don't be shy, and to, uh, so for us to thank everybody who worked so hard to make this possible. Garrett Johnson, Brandon Metchley, Li Yuanjun, Emilio Vasquez, Connor Rawls, and somewhere in this house, Pete Weissman. Thank you very much.